Welcome to the IPX True North Podcast, where we connect people, processes, and tools. All right. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to the IPX True North Podcast. My name is Brandy Taylor, the VP of Services for IPX, for those who don't know me. And today I am looking forward to speaking with a very interesting gentleman named Ravi Karani, who is the founder of Sutro Pool Monitor. So welcome, Ravi. How are you today, sir? I'm doing good. Really, really good. Thanks for having me, Brandy. Oh, yeah. No, it's awesome to have you here. I appreciate the time that you're spending with us. You know, we have a really great conversation lined up today. I'm really interested in a number of things. I would like to gain your take just on different aspects of yourself and your business with Sutro. That'll include, you know, the experience of forming a startup company, as well as other aspects such as data-driven decisions in a world now where data is becoming quite readily available to us in general. So I know the Sutro Pool Monitor, you know, I'm sure a lot of people haven't heard about this, but it's a really extremely innovative idea and a product which I can say as a previous pool owner is extremely helpful and very much needed in today's environment. And today, I think people are really starting to expect that we have smarter devices in all areas of our lives. And it really helps take out the guesswork from pool maintenance, which is really helpful. I know I struggled with our pool water back in Arizona, and that's, you know, maybe a harsher environment where the ambient temperatures can really impact the health of your pool water. But it's a really great device, and I'd love to you know, look forward to hearing a little bit more about your history and how you divide, you know, started up this company with this innovative idea. So what I'd like to do is, I think just to help get it started, I'd like to start with a description of what your product is directly from your website. And so I'll go ahead and just read this for a second is the Sutro pool monitor is a smart device that will help owners manage your pool or spa. It's the simple system to measure, monitor, and get treatment and chemical recommendations to keep your water safe. It transmits a digital message to users through a smartphone app to notify owners when chemicals need to be adjusted for optimal water levels. And our optimal water levels are really important. You know, this is where we spend our time inside these waters and with our children and our families. So to me, I love this product. I think it's something that, gosh, if I had a pool today, it would be something that I would already have, have in there after dealing with, you know, some issues in the past. This is definitely something really nice to have. So Ravi, I guess, you know, I'd love for you to give listeners just a bit of a summary, you know, talk about your story and how you've created Sutro as a company. Yeah, 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 entirely. So imagine, you know, the streets of sunny Southern California back in the 90s. My dad came here as an immigrant from India with a master's in chemistry and couldn't find a job and basically started working as a pool boy, right? That's kind of, you think of LA, think of Southern California, there's a bunch of pools down there and that's where he could find work. There was a pool store that he was working with. The owners needed to go on break, you know, for a lunch break. And a few customers had come in. They had asked him to basically, you know, kind of take over the store. And usually people will go into a pool store to run a water test. And so being the chemist that he was, he took out a swimming pool test kit and basically gave an extremely intelligent recommendation or prescription of what chemicals these customers should use. The word got back to the owners and they're like, you know, why are you out there being a pool boy? And he's like, well, funny story. I'm actually a master's in chemistry. Long story short, he ended up growing that pool store from one to 30 pool stores in Southern California. And, you know, being the son and working in an immigrant family, all of my summers, all of my weekends were spent at the pool store. And so, you know, that's the backing of the idea of where I've, you know, done countless amounts of water tests inside that pool store. I was a pool boy myself. I used to actually run one of my dad's stores in Huntington Beach and really did the full gamut of everything from retail to later on in the maturity of the business, bring the retail business to e-commerce, and then really just kind of figure out what users needed. And I remember distinctly that the number one reason that people came into the pool store was to get a water test done for us to review that water test and then sell them the chemicals that we had in the store. And so that very simple loop of understanding what's in the water and then recommending chemicals based off of that initial chemistry analysis was actually the genesis of Sutro. And so, you know, just kind of really having that backing 
ended up getting a degree in mechanical engineering, surprisingly in fluidics, which is actually, I'll go a little bit deeper into the technology of kind of how it works, but my mechanical engineering degree directly played into the actual building of the device and then ended up working actually in venture capital in a really small stint, which really helped me understand how to pitch the business to VCs because I was on the other side of the pitching relationship, right? I was the guy that was giving the money and now I was the one that was taking the money. And so all of that stuff combined in a very, you know, quick and dirty story is kind of how I initially came to the idea of Sutro. I love it. And, you know, these are the things that, you know, so many of us spend our time doing just because this is what we've always done. And it's so hard for us to pause and think about doing it better. And just the simple act, and I did this so many times, is just taking this thing of water and I drive it all the way to the pool store and they check it for me and they tell me exactly what, because I don't want to buy what I don't need. And so this was just the routine that we did. And so to make something like that, that makes this automatic really changes the game and it really helps change your behavior and free up a really good chunk of your time. And I think an interesting thing to note too is what happens if you don't do that, right? If you've seen your pool when you left it over two or three weekends in Arizona, the thing turns into a mosquito filled, you know, algae, algae bloom. And so the alternative is actually not really pretty. And so outside of even driving that water sample to the pool store and getting the test and doing all that, if you do it the wrong way, not only can you put your friends and family in harm, but your backyard just looks really ugly with algae and probably unsafe too, with all those mosquitoes floating around. Yes, that's terrible. And what I love is that it turns a very reactive behavior into a very proactive behavior. If you're understanding what your water is doing at any point in time, it allows you to be able to take care of those things before you need to be reactive. And that puts yourself in a very powerful position from a maintenance perspective. Entirely. Yeah. A hundred percent. Very neat. Okay. I think in identifying an innovative idea, this is a dream that many people are wishing to identify. You know, they're walking around their daily lives, doing the things that we do, trying to come up with those exact ideas. Tell us a little bit more about your technology and the moment that you knew that this could be a game changer. I kind of mentor a lot of founders and people that are in the startup ecosystem. And the number one thing I tell them is to make sure you have a problem and you validated the problem, right? A lot of people try to have this concept of, if you build it, they'll come. If you build anything, nobody will come, right? You need to make sure that somebody actually has a problem and you either need to give them a vitamin or a pain pill, right? Preferably a pain pill and not a vitamin. But that's really how you get to the bottom of, is my idea going to succeed? And is there actually legs here? So kind of double clicking into Sutro, we initially realized that this was a problem because of the years of experience that me and my dad had in running the pool stores, right? Back to that very natural behavior that that people who own pools have of taking that water sample coming into the pool store is a behavior that very clearly, if you sat behind the counter and you've done this before, you're just kind of like, why isn't there a better mousetrap, right? Why can't I measure water chemistry at my home? There are test strips, there are test kits, right? There's ways to do that. But then the kind of next question is you start questioning yourself of like, well, is this pH 7.8, right? Is this really the red color it should be? And okay, well, now I have a 7.8 pH. I have a 20,000 gallon pool. Let me go ahead and pull out, you know, an Excel sheet calculator that's going to tell me exactly how many chemicals to put in. And I know people out there will be like, oh, I just eyeball it and put in and I've never had an issue. That's probably fine for keeping the water clear, but clear water also doesn't mean healthy water, right? So there is that distinction there. And so in kind of putting all those things together and in bringing my dad's retail store online into e-commerce and continuing to do these water tests, we just understood that basically building this loop in real time using a robot that's floating in your pool to allow you to be proactive and not reactive is a problem state, right? Now, how you solve that problem is a very different question. I could have made the world's best pool service company, right? I can literally hire a bunch of people to drive around and pick up trucks and service as many pools as I can and make that process more efficient. It still solves the problem of a homeowner not having to go to a pool store or not understanding how to do their chemicals themselves. I could have developed a better test strip, right? I could have figured out what are the problems with test strips? Can I build, you know, a phone app that can scan the test strip that can tell you what the colors are? Is that what the problem is? 
which really goes back to my first point of you need to make sure you're inherently understanding what the customer problem is. And so after we figured out that this was a problem and there was all of these solutions we could deploy, we then ended up with a hypothesis that I could develop a pool company, I could develop the best test strip, I could develop a robot that would automatically measure water chemistry. And each of these decisions have their own sub decisions, right? Do you build the app on Android? Do you make something on the computer? And then you kind of go into the weeds of each of those ideas. The question at that point in time is you need to take those three ideas and then validate it with the market to see, hey, pool owner, would you pay a hundred bucks for an extra pool service? Oh, why don't you like pool service? I don't want people in my backyard. I don't trust them. I don't know if they're doing the right thing. Do you want a better test strip app? Well, you know, I still don't know how many chemicals to put in. Do you want a better robot? Well, is the robot going to cost too much? Is it going to be too cheap? You know, is it going to break? So you end up with all these kind of questions on the different business models. You take that back to the whiteboard and you say, what is going to be the highest probability of success in actually solving this issue on any one of our solution sets? And that's really how we came up with the idea of actually building out the robot, because there are many different solutions you can actually implement to that same problem. It's why is your mousetrap going to be the best one to actually solve that problem? And so that's kind of how we initially came up with the idea of the robot. So I love what you said. From my perspective, you know, and from an engineering mindset as well, is it's all about the problem statement, right? And it sounds very simple, Mm -hmm. but people always have a solution in search of a problem. And what I hear you saying is that defining a problem statement is critical for the maximum success of what you're trying to do. And so many people, and I even think in, in school, in engineering school, People are taught how to solve problems and that's what engineers want to do. They want to go fix things, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not about defining a really crisp problem statement first before you go and start solutioning. So to me, that's what I heard you say is we really took the time to really figure it out and make sure that we were solving the right problem and we had the crisp understanding of what would be a really fantastic solution that stood out above others. Yeah, entirely. And I think, you know, I would even go even deeper in that to kind of give some tactical examples or explanations of how that's done, right? Number one, I understood the problem because I legitimately lived it, right? I'd run 10,000s of water tests myself in the pool store. I interfaced with pool customers while running their water tests. I was a pool boy and I ran the water tests at people's homes. That's one side of it, right? I inherently understood the problem. Once I did that, I still needed to get out and make sure that problem was the same attributes that other people had. And what I mean by that is not just sitting on the phone or doing a bunch of Google research on figuring out, you know, are there test kits and watching YouTube videos, but more importantly, actually finding pool owners and the most importantly, keeping your mouth shut and watching them going to their house and saying, I want to watch you test your water. It's a weird thing, but can I just sit here and watch you test your water? You start to notice things. You start to notice when they go and pick up their water test kit. Where was it stored? Oh, it's stored outside with 110 degree weather in the middle of Arizona. Well, that's going to have a little bit of issues in terms of quality on what that water test looks like. Then you look at them when they take the water sample. Did they take it from the skimmer? Did they take it from the deep end? Did they take it from the shallow end? Each of these areas have a different type of water, right? You want to take it from a particular point. Once they get that water test, they're looking at it, the sun, they call their wife, they call their husband. They say, hey, does this look like a 7.8? Does this look like an 8.2? Ah, well, there's a confusion there, right? So if you jump in and immediately start pitching your idea, you'll actually never notice these really small nuances of them conducting this test or seeing the problem firsthand and then just take notes of them, right? At the very end, you can say, hey, what do you think? What if there was this thing that solved this particular issue or that particular issue or this color issue? And then you really start to get to the bottom of what they're doing because you can nitpick on things that they've done because you've seen it. But what I've noticed founders do many times is they're like, I have this amazing idea. They'll just run into the door and say, hey, what do you think about this cool new mousetrap? And people are like, whoa, I don't know what you're pitching me yet. I don't even know what my own problem is. And and that way I would just flip that script around, just kind of really tactically and giving an example there. I like that. I think that's really important. I think people do get very tied to their ideas. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, you know, but I think it's just making sure you take that time and really absorb and understand truly, because if you were just to speak with people, 
I mean, there's, yeah, I go and I grab my kid, I scoop the water up and I do the things, you know, it's going to sound very similar from person to person when in reality, that may not be the case at all. You may really learn something that you would have missed otherwise. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So next I would love for you as we're diving into this startup, I think a lot of people would love to be able to do something like this, but probably hesitate. You know, I think the process for creating a startup, talk to me a little bit more about you know, what else did you do to take this innovative idea to the market and know it would be successful? I think you've talked a lot about that already. Once you decided to form the company, you know, how did you take that idea further? Yeah, I think the two terms that are important there are you need to understand that as a founder, as an entrepreneur, your number one goal is to manage risk, right? That's all you're doing across the entire, your entire life from your morning to your night. All you're doing is managing risk. You're managing risk in product, you're making sure that you're building the right thing at the most efficient pace using the dollars that you have. You're managing risk from a customer standpoint. You're making sure that you're understanding the problem statement. You're building that product for the right particular customer segment that you need. You understand your customer in terms of price point, in terms of how they use the thing. You're managing risk from the investor side. You have to bring in money to actually fund the company. Whether you're doing it yourself or you're actually raising from venture capitalists or you're raising from your best friend, in any case, you have a responsibility for that money that you're taking on. And you're managing risk against that capital on executing your idea against a particular problem statement, right? It's a very simple equation overall. And so risk is what I would put as number one. Just understand that you're managing risk and you're intently understanding the risk on a daily, weekly, monthly basis of what really are you managing because... I can say risk, and then you can think that everything is a risk, right? You're going to go ahead and manage everything all day long, and you're going to end up getting overwhelmed by the amount of things that you need to manage. There's this principle called the Pareto principle, which is the 80-20 rule, right? Many people have heard the 80-20 rule. It's that 20% of the things that you do will end up actually having the outcome that results in 80% of the work that's seen. And so I always look at risk in terms of this Pareto principle of look at the 20 things you need to do out of 100. And that's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck in the actual work that you're doing on managing that risk. The second thing I would say is learn how to sell because outside of risk is you're selling to everybody. You're selling to your employees to make sure that they can come work for you, that they drive into this vision. Many times as a startup, you're usually paying people less than market conditions would, right? You can go get a job somewhere else. How do you drive those people to be passionate about the company, to stay with the company? you're selling to investors, right? You're selling your idea to say, Hey, I need you to give me a buck for you to invest in this company, for you to believe in this vision that I have. You're selling to your customers very literally, right? You're literally selling them a product that you're making and you're selling to yourself, right? Sometimes you also have to understand many people are like, Hey, this is the road to riches. I'm going to become a billionaire, you know, the next Uber, the next, you know, Airbnb. If you're in it for the money, then you should probably just go get a job, right? Because entrepreneurship is a bunch of ups and downs and you're not going to get to that billion dollar state unless you really manage your risk and you learn how to sell and you sell to yourself. And that's what I mean is you have to wake up every morning and some days you're going to be like, why the heck am I doing this? But you have to sell to yourself to say, I'm doing this. I did this up until now to get to X, Y, Z, and I'm going to continue to do it to get to ABC. And so those are the two things I would say that really drove from kind of a philosophical level of kind of really getting out there. And I believe that selling yourself is something that not everyone may get. You know, I think that you have to convince yourself in order to convince others. And I, (laughs) there's no better way, really. And so I think that there's something really big about that mentality. And once your idea is confirmed and you know, like you said, you spent your life doing this, spent years, hours, many hours actually doing the actual tests, et cetera, yourself, you knew that this was going to be largely desired by the market. So, you know, and you talked a lot about, you know, how you were to defining that crisp problem statement. And then the next step is really defining the requirements for what your product is going to do. And so I know that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, functional requirements of what you want it to do, you know, internal requirements, customer requirements, maybe regulatory requirements. Can you talk to me a little bit more about how you were able to collect and define all of those elements? Yeah, yeah, entirely. So the spec or the specification is the most important thing that you can do, right? Because that's what guides everything. If you build a product specification, there's literally going to be dollars that are behind that to make that particular product spec happen 
Are you going to put a Wi-Fi chip inside of the hub that communicates with the Sutro or a Bluetooth? Both of those decisions will have different consequences in terms of how much you're going to pay for a Bluetooth module versus a Wi-Fi module. So understanding the spec is very important. And again, it goes back to your problem statement, right? To your customers, interviewing those customers and seeing, do they have Wi-Fi at the pool? Very valid question, right? You might sit inside the room and tell your engineers, hey, we need a Wi-Fi chip because every single smart home you know, device, whether it be an Alexa, Google Chrome, a Nest, the smart home cameras, they all use Wi-Fi, right? And so you might think, well, we should do Wi-Fi too. Long story short, Wi-Fi is really bad around a swimming pool because Wi-Fi doesn't reach in the backyard many times. There's also a kind of a physics problem with Wi-Fi. The 2.4 gigahertz band rate doesn't work well around concrete, around rebar, mm. and around water. So if you've ever been in a house with really thick walls, you don't get Wi-Fi on the other side of that wall. A pool is just a really, really big wall. Water is really bad for that wave to get through. Another bad decision, right? And so back to going to designing that specification, you need to understand where you're going to deploy the product. Go back to that problem statement. Go back to those customers to really figure out what is a good or a bad decision. And then once you've really hardened that spec, you want to then double validate to make sure that meets what's called an MVP, a minimum viable product. It has to be enough for you to be able to get out there to get it in people's hands so they can start using it. Because the biggest thing you want around your word of confirmation or confirming that your idea works is you're in this continuous confirmation loop, right? Once, even when you get your gen one, your generation one product out there, you've built the best spec, you didn't use Wi-Fi, and you put it out into people's hands, there's going to be one or two issues that end up popping up as there, as there are with all products, right? Look at the iPhone 3G to the iPhone you know, 14 or whatever we're at now. They didn't stop at the 3G. The whole point of confirmation is every single version that they put out there has a better processing power, has better ability to use the newest signal out there, whether it be 4G, 5G, LTE. All of these things end up changing the product in its current sense, given that point in time. And so you're almost in this confirmation loop continuously as you roll out one product, 1,000 products, 10,000 products, 50,000 products. And so I think the only thing is the customer interview, the problem statement doesn't stop once you've finished up that day one. You're always going back and revisiting with those customers and even more customers to see, does this thing make sense? Do I need to launch out a tangential product? Can we get into always in this confirmation loop? The confirmation loop is a cool concept for me because when you say MVP, so many people, I think of when they define what they consider MVP, it's a definition and we're trying to achieve that. But when you have that confirmation loop and you know your MVP has the potential to evolve as you learn more throughout your development phases. So did your MVP change and evolve as you're going through development and test and learning more? A hundred percent. And I wouldn't necessarily look at MVP as a state in time. It's actually a philosophy that we use for everything we put out there, whether it be a feature, a new feature that we're launching in the app, a new tangential product that we're using. This MVP methodology is what is the minimum set of features, the minimum set of problems that we're going to solve with this one particular solution. It goes back exactly to that same problem solution loop. And so that's basically what you're doing, because if you're not validating problems along the risk standpoint, you're burning dollars on things that don't need to be built because you haven't validated that people are going to use them. And that's what the MVP does back to that confirmation loop. The way that I like to think about it is there's this concept of fractals actually in nature. If you look at a seashell, for example, if you zoom into a seashell all the way, you know, in a little seashell pattern, you'll see that the smallest piece of a seashell looks like a seashell. And if you zoom all the way out, the biggest part of the seashell looks like a seashell or for example, trees, right? If you've seen those videos on Instagram, maybe, or something where there's a tree and then they zoom into a leaf and you zoom into the leaf again. And every version of that zoom in or zoom out ends up looking like a tree or a leaf. And so in that sense, that goes back to that confirmation loop, right? That's the point I'm trying to make is even at the smallest molecule of your business, a button, a feature in the app, a particular LED on the hub, you're continuously going through this fractal loop. And regardless of where you zoomed in or zoomed out on, you're always trying to validate a problem solution set to make sure that you're actually building the right thing for the problem you're trying to solve. And as a new company, did you define a development process 
that allowed you to follow a structured methodology for designing and testing the product? Yeah, in, entirely. So like I kind of said in the beginning, the specification and process is extremely important. As you begin to scale your startup from one person to three to five to now we have close to 50 people around the globe, the real problem is how do you make sure that the vision and the problem statement, the solution and the specification and the process that you're actually designing is being executed the way that you expect it to. With that, you have to also be flexible, right? And I say that with kind of, you know, one hand saying that you need to have strict process and the other part saying you need to be flexible. I know it's a little bit, you know, opposite speaking, but I'll give you an example. When you're in the beginning stages of your startup, there's, you know, three to five people in a room and it's very easy for them to trade ideas, to basically build process in real time, to change things in real time. And you need to be iterative because you're just building very quickly. Once you get to 10 people, 20 people, you start getting to manufacturability. You're making 10,000, 20,000 units. You need harder processes. And so we kind of have this philosophy in Sutro of hardening, right? Kind of like the way that you harden concrete. In the very beginning, when you're pouring it out, you have the ability to move it, to mix it, to kind of change it into its shape. And at some point in time when it's working, you go ahead and you harden the shape. And that hardening process, once something has worked two, three, four, five, six times, you go ahead and put it in a document. You basically stamp it closed until you need to go back and revisit it if in case there's a problem. And so that's kind of 100%, I would agree, that you need to build out processes. But the earlier you are, don't get fixated on it. Make sure you are kind of being flexible. But the more you start to harden things and you start to see things being automated, then you go ahead and put those into process. And with a startup, I'm sure that like you already started to lead a little bit of this discussion about being very frugal with your resources and really needing to make some really great, robust decisions early on to help drive the direction of the organization. So did you or do you have any metrics, objectives, OKRs, et cetera, that help support those good results and just good decisions as you guys progress. So you know you're doing the right things at the right time. Entirely. So we actually put in the OKR methodology, which is objective and key results. The objective basically tells you, you know, where are you going? What's your North Star? And the key results tell you, how are you going to get there? The key results have to be metrics driven. So all of our key results have legitimate percentages, right? So for example, our customer service satisfaction, our CSAT was below 92%. And so that literally will be a metric that we need to get CSAT above 92%. And every single month, every single week, we'll go ahead and visit with the customer service team to say, where are you in CSAT, right? Is there an upward trend, a downward trend? And what are we doing to get there? The beauty of OKRs is they leave it at a metrics level. So they give enough incentive and enough agency for the people that are working on that. For this example, the customer service team to make the decisions as they see fit. And so instead of this kind of top-down waterfall approach where the CEO is like, we need to get you know CSAT up to 92% and then he jumps into customer service. You've seen this so many times. And then he starts micromanaging a team that he or she probably doesn't even understand how they work. People feel you know really stepped on. They don't get agency. They end up you know leaving. We want the agent, literally the guy that's answering the ticket to say, hey, I have a metric to get this up to 92%. And because I work in this job every single day, I know that maybe I need to speed up how quickly I get to communicating with the customer. Maybe there's a problem where the customer doesn't get an automated ticket. And that's a problem because they're not seeing this initial, you know, hit back that my message has been received. And so all these like little small ideas that I would have never been able to think up of come from the agents that are actually doing the work based off of the metric that says you need to increase CSAT by 92%. And so a hundred percent, you know, in this OKR methodology, we also look at this kind of fractal mindset, right? So what I mean by that is we have OKRs that are five-year OKRs. We have OKRs that are one-year OKRs. And then we also have things that are quarterly. So the quarterly OKR is the smallest sub-segment of a chunk that we look at, because if you design too much quicker than that, then you're changing really quickly. Those three-month OKRs, those quarterly OKRs drive and are nested into this yearly OKR and everything basically bubbles up or bubbles down given the quarter, the year, or the five-year. And so that's kind of how we do things at Sutro. And we've established those, I would say about four years ago, and they've been extremely helpful in guiding it forward, right? I think there's no perfect solution. There's a bunch of things out there 
The only thing I would recommend is find one and stick to it, build a process that people are going to follow and make sure that you basically preach it and ring the bell every single time you have a meeting. Sounds extremely healthy is the way that I'm hearing you talk about it. And I think that the culture that you're leading with regards to how you're using metrics, I think is really important in that, like you said, it's not about drawing shade on any one area of the business or any function, or it's really about focusing on your continued improvement and making sure that those things are important. And it's not about making anyone feel bad or any kind of delinquency there. It's really all about making sure that we're monitoring the right things and being better as a company. And it goes back to that confirmation loop, right? So even though the confirmation loop holds true in this OKRs methodology as well, because at every state, even from a customer service standpoint, right, of increased CSAT to 92%, again, is a confirmation loop that there is something wrong here. There's something wrong within the business, within the way that the product works or the way that we're answering customer service tickets comes back to that confirmation loop. And I think a lot of problems that, that larger corporations and older corporations make is they think that their business is fixed in time. And they then start throwing shade that, hey, we're not meeting revenue targets. Well, let's ask why, right? Let's ask why first, figure out the actual root cause of what it is, and then give agency to the people that we've hired to make sure that they can do the best job that they want instead of you projecting downwards how you think the company should run based on the way that you did it you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Very good. You know, and I think development processes of what works for us early on may not, you know, always work for us as we progress. And can you talk a little bit about maybe how that's evolved over time for you and, and what you guys have done to adapt? So when we were first starting Sutra, like I mentioned, there was eight to 12 people in a room and there actually wasn't any OKRs there. There was weekly targets that we had to hit because we were living on a week to week basis, right? We were raising funding. We were in the middle of getting product out there. We would find an entirely new thing that a customer did that we were like, Hey, we should totally zoom into this area and see if this makes sense. Or if that makes sense, there was a ton of iteration having happening on the product, you know, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. do we go LTE? What's cost benefit analysis. And so at that stage, you sometimes don't want something that's as strict or, you know, robust as OKRs. You kind of just need a one line goal sentence on the middle of a whiteboard that's in the middle of the office that everybody can look up at and say, that's what we're trying to do today. And in that case, that works really well, right? But when you start to grow and you have thousands of units out there in the field, that one line on top of the whiteboard doesn't work for your team in China that's doing manufacturing, the chemistry team in Canada and the development team in the Balkans. And so in that case, you needed to merge to this OKRs methodology. And I'm sure in the near future, you know, as we grow bigger, the OKRs may grow themselves out or we might end up with a newer version of what those will look like. And so I think again, back to that confirmation loop, you also have to be intrinsically looking at your own business and seeing, does that one line on top of the whiteboard make sense? Does the OKRs methodology make sense? Or do I need something more MBO management based objectives or something that's a little bit more granular and keeping that pulse on the company does, you know, give that to you. And so hundred percent that does also evolve over time and just keeping a close eye on that will give you when you should actually change it. And I think OKRs are one aspect of robust decisions. Another one I'd like to get your take on really is ensuring leadership support and alignment. So tell us a little bit about how you were able to ensure that your leadership team across the board is in agreement with where the company and where the product is going. Yeah. So the kind of more mature that we got and the more people that we brought on board, we ended up splitting the organizations into kind of two separate chunks. There is the revenue operations side, right? Anybody that's responsible for bringing in revenue. And then there's the product and engineering side. Before everybody used to be all in the same room, everybody was, you know, standing and talking all together. In keeping your kind of project managers or folks that are at the top of the organization aligned, having that kind of duality of product and rev ops really allowed us to kind of keep the vision and the execution in the same buckets. Because now I'm basically speaking to one person that's driving product decisions and one person that's driving where the money's coming in from. In between there, we actually have a project manager that keeps one ear towards all of the requests that we're getting from the customer side, right? We're always listening to problems. We're always trying to figure out, are there bugs? Are there feature requests that we should be putting in to stay ahead of the market? And from the product side, 
she's actually always relaying all of that feedback as she prioritizes it, right? You can't do everything at all times. And so she's running the Pareto principle of what's 20% of these features that's going to give us 80% of the wins and working with the product team to say, hey, we need to deploy these 20 features. What's the timelines? What's the budget? Who do we need on this job? What other things are we working on? And then we basically roll those into an actual agile development methodology. And so that kind of situation really helps us keep everybody in the same loop and then also understand and take feedback from the customers and bring that to the product team. Within the RevOps team, I know people may not be familiar with that. It's called revenue operations. I said that earlier. It's comprised of three general segments. There's sales, there's marketing, and there's customer service. Sales and marketing, very logical. You understand that they go out there and sell the product or they run marketing campaigns. The CS side, people usually will have customer service in its own little bucket, but we've purposefully put that in the revenue operations side because customers will come in with questions and there's an opportunity to sell. And usually existing customers that come in with a problem or have something that they need fixed are retention opportunities. And so customer service is very linked to revenue and keeping them separate is actually doing your business, you know, a negative job because you should probably have them close to the revenue side of what you're doing. But that's kind of in a long and short of how we structure the organization today. You mentioned, you know, get, making sure you have that feedback loop from the customer base And I know there's, you know, complaints and opportunities and things like that come verbally through from the customer base. But I assume that Sutra must be collecting a large amount of data through the actual monitors themselves. Are you able to utilize that data as well to help drive any future goals or objectives? Yeah, 100%. So we do capture all of the chemistry data is, I would call it a seed for a much larger data set that we want to build around two main functions. The first is around preventative maintenance, right? So within swimming pools themselves, we want to be able to predict what's going to happen with your water and when it's going to happen with your water. You can imagine, you know, a really hot day in Arizona has a negative effect on your chlorine. And I want to be able to filter in that data and see your chlorine trend so you can fix that before your pool goes green. The second thing we aim to do is Sutro really wants to be the product that's at the apex or the center of where water is used in any process, right? So if you kind of scratch your brain to figure out where water is used in the world, you can think of very legitimately agriculture, drinking water, cooling water towers, the beer and the wine that we drink is processed with water, any of the beverages we have, cleaning in hospitals, janitorial. And so all of these places require water to be tested. And Sutro, in our product definition, when we first went out there, we had a vision to tackle this larger water goal. And so part of what we built is a plug and play methodology to actually measure the parameters that are in those other water industries. And so kind of that's how we're going to use the data to your question is one preventative maintenance, you know, telling you what's going to happen before you get to your water. And then secondarily, getting into these other much larger markets where water is really, really active in the production process. And so that's kind of how we're going to use the data. So I love that segue to the larger global scale of things. We've been talking so much about individual pools and really focus there, but there's such a bigger implication of really where this technology could be utilized globally. Can you tell me a little bit more about maybe where you guys have interested, where you found some interest there or, or anything that you're doing today to think about that larger, maybe eventual goal? Yeah. The two biggest segments that we're looking at right now, actually three largest, would be agriculture. So in agriculture, what usually happens is farmers need to measure how much nutrients, how much fertilizer they're putting into the water and into the plants. And many of California's crops in particular actually use drip irrigation where they put the nutrients inside the water. And so that raises a really interesting proposition, right? If you're putting nutrients in the water to water the plants, Sutro can sit right in the middle of that equation and tell you how much nutrients you need to put in and build that feedback loop the exact same way that we look at chlorine and tell you how much chlorine to put inside your swimming pool. So one market's agriculture. The second market is actually cooling water towers. Cooling water towers are in our cities. They're used in much of our built environment in the large cities. And the biggest problem there is something called calcification. Calcium gets inside the cooling water towers, and then they end up causing really, really large maintenance runs through. So you have to pay a lot of money to clean up the calcium. Again, you're putting water into a cooling water tower. There's calcification happening. 
Sutro can sit in between that equation to tell you how much calcium or how much calcification is happening. So you can build a preventative and proactive solution versus being reactive the same way you were in a swimming pool. And the third is actually drinking water, right? If I say Flint, Michigan, I think that raises a lot of eyebrows and it's kind of all I really have to say, right? We want to make sure that drinking water is clean and safe for everybody in the U.S. and around the world. And that is a huge proposition, you know, a lot of work to be done there. And so those are the three markets we're looking at. Thank you. I love that. Just to kind of close out our discussion today, might you have any advice just thinking big picture, you know, any advice for anyone listening who might want to attempt to push maybe some sort of innovative idea into production based on your experience? To, and I think you've covered so many things here, but if there was one thing, is there anything that you might point out for listeners today? I would say 30 interviews. That's my number. Get to at least stop building your product. If you do not have 30 interviews with customers you think you're going to sell to, get out there and get them. That would be my number one advice to any founder or entrepreneur out there trying to get their product out. Thank you. And if anyone out there just even owns a pool or a spa and would like to learn more about Sutro um, and what it might offer them, is there a best way that you'd recommend for listeners to dive in and learn more about Sutro? Yeah, we're all around. We're on uh, Instagram, on TikTok, on social. But the easiest way to get a hold of us is to go to mysutro.com. And if you want to, you could just type in Sutro Pool into Google and we pop up at the top. So. That's okay. the best way to get a hold of us. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And it's been really fun just talking with you and learning more about your background. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been awesome. Thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe and review the show. And for more information on IPX, visit IPXHQ.com.